On my first visit to New Orleans, I had the opportunity to go to Central Grocery and experience firsthand what I had always been told was the greatest sandwich in the world, a muffaletta. I have to agree, it is my favorite sandwich. And I suppose most of us have a sandwich that we would say is our favorite. And the thing about a sandwich is that they're really all basically the same in terms of their structure. You've got something on the top that is the same as something on the bottom with something different, the, the real meat, so to speak, right in the middle. Now, I tell you that because what we have just read is a sandwich of sorts, at least in terms of its structure. It's known as a Mark sandwich, and there are several of them that are found in Mark's Gospel. You've got something at the top that's pretty much the same as something you've got at the bottom, and then there's the meat that's right in the middle. And like any sandwich, though, this Mark sandwich has to have both the top and the bottom to hold everything together. Now, as we read this passage, here we go again with the rapidity of Mark's gospel. In the first chapter alone, in just the first 28 verses, we have the ministry of John the Baptist, we have the baptism of Jesus, we have the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, the arrest of John, the calling of the first disciples, and finally this episode of teaching and healing in the temple in Capernaum. Now that is six different episodes in just 28 sentences. Now Matthew and Luke they take almost five chapters each to get us to this point in the story. And then there's also that word immediately. It just keeps showing up. We see it in the first verse that we just read. We see it in the last verse. And we also see it right in the middle of this Mark sandwich. And back to that sandwich we go. On the top at the beginning, we have people marveling at the authority of the teaching of Jesus in the synagogue in Capernaum. Then in the middle, we see him passing out an unclean spirit from a man in the crowd. And then at the bottom, we find the people again amazed at the authority of Jesus in being able to cast out the spirit with merely a word. Now let's begin by looking at the meat of the sand, the, the contents that are right in the middle. There was always a question as to what was really going on in this incident and in so many other incidents in the Gospels where we find Jesus casting out demons or evil spirits from someone who is possessed. Now was it really an evil spirit. Now, was it really a demon? Or was it simply some sort of physical or mental or spiritual malady that was afflicting this man? And was it something that modern medicine or psychotherapy could have addressed? Now, the reason that the question is still asked is because we simply don't know the answer. And we probably never really will. I think, though, we all know that there really are demons. We know that there are demons that lurk all about us and attempt to capture us. There was a cartoon in New Yorker magazine that depicted a man leaving for work one morning. He's holding on to a liquor bottle in one hand and his briefcase in the other. And he said to his wife, it's take your inner demons to work today. <laughs> yes, we know. We know that some of the things that 
try to capture us, some of the things that try to control us, many of the things that long to possess us really are demonic and destructive. And on the other hand, there are things that modern medicine can cure. I'll never forget an experience that I had a number of years ago with an adolescent boy who was suffering from Rye syndrome. I think he may have been one of the first diagnosis cases before the link was made between this horrendous and deadly affliction and the taking of asthma by children. Now, Timmy was, by all accounts, one of the finest young boys you would ever meet. He was 12 years old. He was quiet, he was soft spoken, he was intelligent, he was kind, he was obedient. And to this day, I would be hard pressed to think of a finer young man. And one day, though, a seemingly common illness with Timmy turned ugly. And he had to be light flight into a hospital 50 miles away because the doctors suspected Rye syndrome. And Masu and I were there with Timmy's parents at the hospital. But none of us could go back to the place where they had taken him. But we could hear him. And for 12 of the most excruciating hours I have ever spent, we heard sounds coming from the far end of that hospital corridor that I hope to never hear again. There was screaming and there was shrieking that one would swear could not possibly have been made by a human being, but rather by a wild animal of some sort. And the grotesquely foul language intermittent with those screams could not possibly have been coming from Timmy. It was. And the doctor said that it was going to go either one way or another. Timmy would either be dead in 24 hours or on his way home. Unfortunately, it was the latter. And the next day, the, the very next day, Timmy was back in school. And never had any other side effects from it. Now, in another time and in another place, what young Timmy experienced surely could have been classified as demonic possession. But in reality, it took a combination of prayer and modern medicine to ease the swelling on his brain and enable him to survive. There was something that possessed his mind and his brain, and he was delivered from it almost immediately. But I think of others. I think of others whose mind isn't working as perhaps we think it should, who aren't delivered from their affliction. I think of a, another young man named Patrick. Now Patrick was in his late, to, late 20s to mid 30s, and he started attending a church that I was serving. He lived in a nearby group home, and he would always bring his little stuffed lion to worship with him. And during the service, you might occasionally hear that lion let out a little roar that sounded remarkably like Patrick. Now, Patrick didn't seem to be lonely because he frequently talked about his friends, Bob, Pete, and and apparently they lived at the same group home with Patrick. And, and Patrick said they had a great time together, talking and reading and playing games together. And one day I stopped by to visit Patrick. And the person in charge had me wait in the living room while he called Patrick to tell him I was there. Now Patrick was delighted to see me. And he invited me to come back to his room to meet Bob and Pete and Al. He said they were in the middle of the game. Then I walked into Patrick's room, and there, on his bed, there was a shoots and ladders gate. It was all set up. And sitting on three sides of the game board, with the fourth spot reserved for Patrick, were three stuffed animals, Bob and Pete and Dad. Now, I don't think I have to tell you that it broke my heart to see the reality of who Patrick's friends were. 
Then I also thought of how thankful I was that Patrick had felt comfortable coming to our church. Now, Patrick wasn't like <coughs> Timmy. Now, Patrick wasn't going to be immediately or ever delivered from whatever it was that afflicted his mind. And yet still he was drawn to the church. Why? Why was it that he wanted to go there? You know, I think it was because he felt that he could enter those doors and really become a part of a family. He felt that he would be met there with understanding and with love and with acceptance. And I think this is where we have to go back to the other parts of the sandwich, the bread, that which is found on the top and on the bottom, or in the case of this Mark sandwich, that which is found at the beginning and at the end. Where it's the authority of Jesus that astounds the people in the temple. And they are initially astounded at the authority of his teachings, and later they are astounded at his power to be able to release this man from his captivity to evil with a single command. We've been talking for several weeks now about the call of God in our lives. You remember a line from an old Bob Dylan song? time when he was going through a great spiritual struggle. He wrote, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Now, the question that today's message asks is, are you possessed? Well, Dylan's words suggest that it might be more appropriately stated like this. By who are you possessed? Or by what are you possessed? Because you see, you and I are going to be possessed. We are going to be possessed by something. What's it going to be? Is it going to be the evil spirits that try to grab hold of you, grab hold of your heart and your mind and your soul and your body and dictate who you are and what you do? Or is it going to be Jesus Christ? See, I think a lot of people within the church are reluctant to allow themselves to be possessed by Jesus. And they're reluctant because they know that he asks hard questions, he makes great demands, and he issues formidable challenges. He asks us to leave everything else behind and follow Him. He demands that we set aside our selfish and self-serving lifestyle and live sacrificially for others. He issues the formidable challenge to accept the Patricks of this world, not only into the church, but into our very lives as well. You see, if you don't think you have to serve Jesus, then you can satisfy yourself with a religious smorgasbord. You can take a little of this and you can take a little of that. You might even pick up a sandwich along the way. But it certainly won't be a Mark sandwich. They're rooted as it is on the top and on the bottom in the authority of Jesus. You see, when you go looking for a religious smorgasbord, you really wind up with a hodgepodge of nothing. And yet you're still possessed. You're possessed by your own make-believe faith with you as the ultimate authority, and the one you end up serving is yourself. See, the question, the demands and the challenges of Jesus are the only way to find true fulfillment in life because the God who created us created us to be possessed by those questions, by those demands, and by those challenges. 
When we submit to the authority of Jesus, and when we trust His teachings, and when we look to Him for direction, we open ourselves to a brand new world of exciting possibilities. You see, we were created to love. We were created to serve. We were created for compassionate living and sacrificial giving. When we find ourselves amazed at the authority of Christ's teaching, when we see the power that He has over the evil spirits that threaten our lives, and then when we submit to His authority over everything we say and everything we do, when we find ourselves possessed by Jesus Himself, it is then that we have chosen a Mark Sandwich. And I would suggest that that's really the greatest sandwich.